Battle Warrior Podcast is kicking back in gear. I am in Oshkosh. We are in the Venture Project studio, guys, and we're going to come at you with a lot of big-time guests. So stay tuned, guys. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Battle Warriors out, y'all. New content coming soon. See ya. Deuces. I don't care, man. I'll be up at two and we'll be rolling again. So, hey guys, welcome to okay. Battle Warrior Podcast. I have a sweet, amazing guest on the other end here. Actually, he's a good brother that we met prior to even doing this. What, two months ago? Three months ago? Yeah, about two months ago. Two or three. I know. Time's flying by. <laughs> it goes by so quick. And uh, I was going to say the second venture project member today or in the last couple of weeks that you interviewed with so hey well we are welcoming nick wingo to the battle warrior podcast he was on a prior one with a different guy from venture project we'll say it that way but welcome to this podcast man you are you know two for two here at this place i appreciate it man i'm, I'm super super stoked to be on the ass i appreciate appreciate it and anytime i get to just share my, my story you know, maybe shed some light on to some people. I'm always, you know, super stoked to do that. So I appreciate you, man. Yeah, no problem. And, and like we were talking about in the, I didn't even know about it this prior to being at that uh, table at the convention that we were at earlier. And, and what I was explaining with someone else that, you know, a colleague of ours that we're part of in a group, he's sitting here, he's like, you don't know about it until you get to know the guy. So um, here I'm sitting Right next to my office, guys, is I have a book called Building Grit, which is going to be actually it is released, which is your own personal book. Mm -hmm. And should I say that pretty much the same guy that I'm going to be associated with, too? I don't know the whole situation behind the scenes of that, but um, we are tied to one amazing person that does that stuff. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we we met kind of through Mike, Mike Fallett. He does the, he that guy is just amazing what he does with with books, and he was such a huge uh, catalyst catalyst for me, my book, and and helped me get get it out there. There, and I was super appreciative for him. That yeah, that that is legit. He's a super super cool dude. And um, so the biggest thing let let's let's dig deeper into building great guys. Um, I have actually in my family a firefighter, so we're in a. I, I didn't have time to drop this book off, but this book's actually going to get delivered right to him. So um, dig deep of why you wrote it or just in general, dig deep of all the stories that are built into it. Yeah, for sure. So Building Grit is legitimately about my story of how I ended up with PTSD and what I've done to kind of start, start to work through. And so, so I've been a fire. Well, I'm not a firefighter anymore, but I was a, fire, was a firefighter for eight years. And in my time as a firefighter, I encountered a ton of just, just terrible stuff. Lost 10 friends since five to suicide, uh, five to, you know, just other things, line of duty deaths, cancer, all the things that, that kill first responders and firefighters. Uh, you know, what people don't know and what, what people don't talk is the fact that as firefighters, we go out and protect the public, but, but we have all this stuff that happens to us because of it. we have trauma that we encounter or we have you know, you know, a loss encounter, we are, we have these things that, that start to up over the years. And so what happened to me was, is I hit a point in my career where I had had too much trauma. I couldn't take any more trauma, trauma, and I didn't even know it. In fact, I didn't even, I wasn't, the, wasn't the one to really speak up. I just, just said, Hey, I looked at my partner and said, Hey, I'm having nightmares, which have been going on for five years. I have been sleeping like two hours a night. It was really bad. I thought that that was just, was just all part of just being a firefighter. I thought that that's what it was about. I thought, I thought it was a, a piece of what, what I did. And I was, I was so mistaken. I was so wrong in that, in that belief. But literally, it took somebody to say, hey, you need to get, get help and get checked out for me to, for me to step out. And even when, when I did, I, I kind of was like, this is kind of a bullshit. I don't have this. I don't have PTSD. This, this is not who I am. It's just I'm having trouble sleeping. Like It's just part of it. And as I dove, dove into it, I recognized how bad I was. I rec recognized that my nightmare, nightmares, and I was having flashbacks, and I was having outbursts of anger. anger. I, I wasn't sleeping. I was, 
you know, having all these problems and they were, they were all of my post-traumatic stress. In fact, I was having physical ailment. I was, a, I had sleep apnea. I, I had um, gout. I had asthma issues and lung issues. And, and as I worked through all these things, all those things, things have start to clear up, up as I've come out of, out of the fire department because I had all this inflammation and build up, up my body from the stress of being on the job. And I had no idea about it. And so it, it, it got so bad to the, the fact that I actually had to go in for treatment. And I went in for treatment for 35, 35 day Maryland at the center of excellence, which was life changing for me. And when I went, I started right. I started, I started to join. And when I got, I got back in treatment about, about a week after I got, got back, one of the guys I went to treat, treatment with, he killed himself, he committed suicide. And so I recognized like there was a huge problem. And so I started doing some research and estimated that three to 500 firefighters are committing suicide every year. It's a scary number. We just started documenting and we documented 195 cases last, last year. We say, they say that it, it, it's, I mean, it, it's a, it's a 7% suicide rate that's higher than veterans. So this, so this problem, it's a major problem and no talking about it. And here's the thing, everybody you talk to, and even people who in this podcast right now, they're going to go, I had no idea. I thought firefighters fought fire. That, that is such a small percentage of what we actually, actually do. We only, we only fight, I would only fight 10 to 12 fires a year. And, and so the reality is, is that the other 80 to 90% of the time, we are running, running medical calls. So that's suicide. Death, death, murders, um, you know, you know, abuse, um, just general small sick people, alcohol, drug addicts. I mean, I mean, we run all these calls that we really understand that when when something that no, nobody knows what to do, you call the fire department, you call the fire 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 because what we do, we're problem fixers, we fix problems. And what ha- happens is that because because we're problemsters, we never really fix ourselves right? because we, we, don't, we don't know how to fix ourselves. We don't know how to deal with all, all this stuff. And it's, it's because for years, the culture has been that you just kind of shut stuff down and you don't deal with it and you don't talk about it and you just let it go, go. It's, it's slowly ching, but it's like, like when I came in, that what you did. You just shoved it down. You just buried it. You, you buried it deep and you didn't let anybody know about it because if you did, you were weak and um, you know, weren't fit for duty. And so that's how I ended up with the book is I, I wrote a book because I want, wanted people to see that number one, this is, is what really going on. And number two, like it's okay to, to not be okay. And, and I have been learning how, how to deal with my emotions, how to how not even deal, just, just manage. Okay, I tell people I'm learning how to manage all my symptoms of post-traumatic stress. I'm, so I'm learning how to manage through all, through all these things because, because it's something that I'm likely to have to manage for the rest of my life, my life. And it's okay. Okay. It's okay. And what I can do is, is share my knee and help other people um, recognize number one, that they have post-traumatic stress, stress. Number two, recognize that there are ways to maneuver through it and you don't have to end up, end up like I, where you have to walk away. So. Yeah. And um, I never, and I'm going to be another one to add a list. I never knew knew it on the firefighter side, obviously, yes, veteran side, but police force side of it. Um, I'm not going to get too in depth on the stories and stuff. Cause I don't hear much from that end and pretty much it's the same thing. He, you know, that person's first responder. They're the first one out to the scenes before the engines even show up. So um, I don't even want to know what I, what happens. Oh man. There's so many things. And you know, it's so many things I wish that my eyes could unsee Right. Like that's one of the biggest problems is there's so many things that just a laser ingrained in my brain that, you know, if there was one of those men in black, little flashy sheet things, like sign me up, man, man, because I would take it right down and rid some, some of the, I've seen it. Just can't, it just, yeah, can't, yeah. you know, but I'd take, take it. And you know, you know, it's, it's one of the key things you just said is that most everybody knows, knows that veteran problems, Right. Like, and e- even cops are starting to get recognized a little, a little bit more. Oh, okay. Cops could have some PTSD because they see some stuff. But when it comes to firefighters, fighters, we just, people just don't like, oh, fire, America's heroes. They're the best. You know, they are, they're amazing. They do all the things, uh, but they don't, don't recognize what we actually really have going on. So, yeah. And you guys are even there before nurses and all that stuff. So it's like, well, you- well, 
Nurse, I mean, none of, none of I mean, we figure basically, basically what happens is we go on go scene, on. it's called 911, uh, and we go on scene, and, and then we people to the, to the hospital. So, I mean, you know, we, we, li we li literally are the, we're the ones that take them to the hospital. We are the first ones there. And so, so what our job is, is to take an absolute chaotic me mess and to try to make the best of that situation and kind of maneuvers around and then take people and get them headed in the right, in the right direct direction. You know, literally what we do, what we do, we, we come in at the, the absolute worst time of whatever the emergency is. Yeah. And I don't want to say, I can't even imagine that. I don't eat on my intimate. I don't even want to imagine that just because obviously I live in the Midwest. I know you're all, you know, in the mountains or Denver. I will just slip, yeah. slip that in there. Um, <laughs> Yes, tones are different and stuff's different. I get that, but you, you get in these larger municipalities that are, you know, half million to a million. You're going to see some goofy shit, and obviously, yeah, heroin and drugs and all that are going to be part of it. Yep, yep. I mean, I was, you know, you know, my my department for a fairly good sized apartment, and so I was on average running, you know, you know, I know twelve to thirteen calls a day. Most most days, I mean, my nights wrecked. You know, you're running twelve to thirteen calls a day. A day that's one for two hours. I mean, you know, you figure you do 48 hours. I was doing 48 hour shift, shifts, two days on, four days off. My world was wrecked. My sleep was ter terrible, you know? And just, I mean, I would see so much. It just, just adds up over time. All that stuff just adds up and it's just, you know, it, it's crazy. And you, and you can realize it until you're out of it. And you, you look back and you're like, man, and you start talking to, talking to people like, you know, for example, for someone who has seen what I what I see, to see a death or to see a, see an accident, they're always like, "Whoa, whoa!" So you know, it like really catches them off guard, and they can't believe what they, they just saw. And for me, it's like not a big deal because I've seen so many. Just you get completely just um, you know, it's just it's just that, that there's you don't even work up anymore. It's not good. Like it's not good that it gets to that point, right? Um, and, and so that's what we don't recognize is that think about the worst, worst thing you've had in a lifetime. Now have that happen over and over and over and over and over and over again. Right. And just watch it over and over and over again. It's rough. It's rough. It's rough to do. Yeah. And you become, yeah, yeah. and I'm going to use, I'm not going to get too much in depth of my example, but it's a, the thing that I would tell people is you almost become so used to it that you become numb and cold. You do. You you know how to feel, but you just don't know how to feel at that time. But you know, I didn't even know how to know how to feel more. To be honest with you, I lost my ability to even to even know what my emotions were. I, I had had one emotion. It was mad, mad angry. Like, that was it. I was mad and angry all the time. I was, you know, I don't. I didn't even know how to. Act. I mean, I, I mean, it was so bad that I really, up until my dad died. died that was the first time I actually felt sad, sadness. Like, and it was, uh, it was rough because I didn't even know what to do with it. I didn't know what they never felt that that emotion before. And so as I learned about my emotion, emotions started learning like, oh, okay, this is sadness. This is anger. This is, you know, all, all these things. It's wild how um, just everything changed for me, for me, right? It's wild, it's wild how everything about my life has changed just by simply learning how to feel, feel my emotions. Yeah. Just that in itself was such a huge, huge step for me. I mean, that was like groundbreaking stuff. And some, some people are, like, you know, oh, I, I, yeah, I would challenge people because some people say, like my wife, for example, she's like, oh, I know, I know my emotions. And as we, we sort of really work through stuff, stuff like she didn't know what her emotions were or how to feel them. And so I, I challenge people often who say, oh, I, I know my emotions. I, I, I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of people who think that they're in touch with their emotions are definitely not. And we really start to start to dive into it. I'm talking like, I'm so, so get so good with it, with this shit. Like, I can tell you, like when I get angry, my, my face starts to feel like it's burning. I get this little vein right here in my forehead that pops out and I can, I can start to feel pulse in it. Like I can feel the top of my head start, start to get, hot. you know, when I, Get, get sad. I can feel it, feel it in my chest. I can't, like, I feel like I can't breathe. I can't get up, get a full deep breath. Like I'm learning how, how to physically feel what my body is feeling when I start to feel those emotions. And 
people, lots of people are like, what, what do you mean? Well, yeah. Like when you, when you truly are starting in touch with your emotions, your body has physical reactions, every emotion that you have. It just, just us. It's the, the truth. I mean, I mean, think about it. When you're mad, think about the, the physical reactions that your body, your body have. Those, those physical reactions, surprisingly enough, come before the emotion does. Most, most people don't know that, right? Like they, they think their emotion comes and then, and then the physical ring comes from their body or they don't even recognize that they have a physical action. The, the, and I'm going to excuse me getting mad. I actually start shaking before I get pissed. Mm-hmm. Like yep. you, you just, it's like, you could just feel it just getting not, I don't want to say vibrating, but you could just feel it coming. Yep. And then I'll, I'll, I'll tell everyone straight out. It's like, okay, Hey, you got about two minutes here before you're not going to hear what's coming out of my mouth. And you could just feel it build, 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 build. Um, um, now the, now this is a weird thing too. So like when my grandpa, uh, grandpa passed, I did not feel that way. I actually wanted to take a baseball bat and just start destroying the walls, which, which was, which was completely different because I went from like, okay, pissed off, you know, like short tempered to not say like the why me, not, not the why me's. I don't want to use the term the why me's, but it was the pissed off because it's tough to even explain, but it's just, it's a different rage that I occurred. It was more like a rage versus like a, a pissed off, which is weird. Well, it's good that it's good that you could recognize that, right? Like in just evaluate and go back and look at it, got it. Cause a lot of they, they never do that. They just, you know, it's so important, especially when you're starting to talk about, um, you know, you know, depression, anxiety, and, and mental health, and all these things that are a major focus. You, you really have to dive into and figure out exactly, like, like, okay, what is it that is causing these emotions? How am I? What? Are, where is my body feel, feeling these things? What are the things? Because really, you you can't maneuver through things if you don't even know how to identify them. Right, like if if you don't even know what sadness is to you, how are you gonna fix fix it? How are you maneuver through that? How are you gonna work through that if you don't even know what it is, right? And so it's so important for us us to get in touch with our emotions and re- really just identify like like okay, they're the emotion. This is how my body respond, responds. And this is what I do. This is how I react. Um, it's just it's such a huge part of mental health. I mean, I found it was one of the biggest pieces. One of the big, one of the, one of the first breakthroughs was figuring out that I sucked at emotion, emotions. Like I went to treatment and they handed me this wheel it was the fiends wheel. And I was like, what is this? And I started going through, through the emotions wheel. And I, and I was like, I didn't even know that most of these things on here were for emotion you could have. Like I knew you knew you could be angry and sad. And that was, that was about it. Like, I, I was blown, blown away by the fact that I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's, there's all these emotions that we, we feel. Like I was like, this is some hippie shit. Like this is, <laughs> I'm, I'm not used to this, right? Right. Um, but now, now, like, I have a, I have a Zen room in my house, and I got ham, hammocks and yoga, and I mean, I mean, I, my everything about me has changed in the past year because because it has to. Like like what I was doing was not working. It was not working. I was a bad path. Um, and the, the path I was heading, I was headed down to kill myself. Like I, I was going to be another statistic legitimately. However, I, I, like, I'm just not a quitter. I, I don't quit. It. So I, 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 that, um, that thing came with that because I, I knew like, like it wasn't an option for me. And so, although it's hard to explain, but although though it is there, I was not to give into it, right? Um, I knew that I had to do something. Thing I had to continue, continue to move on. I had to continue to move forward, and so that's that's why, that's why I went to treat. That's why I'm doing all these things that I'm doing right now, because because these are the things that continue to help me to keep moving forward. They're the things that can continue to help to manage my post traumatic stress. You know, doing these things, even like like being podcast and talking about it, it's cathartic for me. It helps me to continually. Um, you know, to, to continue through these things, things and continue to talk about them. I mean, continually do these things. Like, like, you know, it's it's such such a big deal. Just talking about your emotions and talking about all the stuff you've been through, like just that that in itself is 
it's so amazing what you do and how, how far you come in your mental mental health just talking about it. And, and I'm going to tell everyone that wants to start a podcast, a podcast or something. Um, a lot of us are in the same boat when it comes to that stuff. So like for us, I would say what 95% of us, this is therapeutic. Yeah, absolutely. Even, even though, I mean, even though we don't think it is, it is. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. It is because here's the thing is that, uh, in our conversation, I'm going to, I'm going to bring stuff. You're going to bring stuff, stuff up. You know, I'm, I'm going to have things where I might have breakthroughs in conversations. You may have breakthrough conversations like this. You know, it's the same with uh, podcasts about business, business, right? You know why the people start podcasts about business? Because, because it gives them access to high level players, right? right? That they do. That's how they, that's how they get connections is by doing these pod, podcasts, by um, um, getting us out there because, uh, it's crazy how much you can learn just through a conversation. By simple station, it's it's wild how much, how much stuff you can from it. And and I'm gonna tap on Zoom here for a second. So like we have audio and video. Video. Right. So like someone who's a visual learner like us, dude, I'm blown away, I'm blown away because away. well, obviously you have a backdrop on, but we could be sitting there on the chalkboard and shit and learning way better than we did in the classroom. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely absolutely. I mean this is the you know, this is the best way to learn, like, like legitimately learn um, stuff that's, that's really valuable. I mean, you know, school is there and it's what we have to do until we're high school age, but I am convinced you do not need college. Um, the older I'm getting, yeah, you're hundred percent true. It's, it's, I, I'm gonna use the term optional. Obviously there's still old school part of me where it's like, Hey, get something with your name on it, but right, um, right for sure. not five years yeah. worth of stuff. I mean, I, I, and I guess, for me, I look at it like if you have a specific thing you're looking into, colleges can be a good route for you, like to figure that out to kind of get you the, the training you need. I mean, or you can just go out and, and hustle, learn how to do things. The I mean, you know, there's just so many so many ways. That, here's the, the thing: there is so much property in the world it is silly, like. If anybody tells you, tells you there is no opportunity, opportunity there's nothing you can do and you're stuck and you can be like, you're so, so full of shit. It's not true. It's just, just not true. I have to, to tell people no constantly. Like I have people reach out to me. Can you, can you, do you want to do this? this? Do you want to do this thing? You want to sell insurance? You want to sell, do you want to do, do crypto? You want to do this thing? You want, you want to do like, no, 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 no. <laughs> right. Like literally. Literally, there's so much, so much opportunity in the world. It's crazy to me. I, and I never knew it. Yeah, right? I yeah, thought, yeah. thought that I'd be a firefighter for the rest, the rest of my life. I thought that, that was it. I thought that was life for me. And I would be a firefighter and I would retire and, um, you know, probably die cancer, to be honest with you. Because that's what all, all my friends have done. Have done. And, and when I got out, I recognized, number, number one, I can't go. Because I'm going to end up in the same position I was before or like. The doctor looked at me, looked at me and she's like, do you want to end up exactly where you were before? And I was like, no, it's like, you shouldn't, shouldn't go back to the fire department because you're just not, not fit anymore. Your, your mind is not, you don't have the capacity to add in any more trying to your life. And at first that was gut wrenching, right? It was difficult. It was a hard truth to accept. But as I stepped away from it, I'm like, I'm like, you know what? It, it's okay. It was, it was God's plan. It was where I was meant to be, and I I have something bigger, bigger, and better to do, and more important, right? And so now for me, building grit, and grit is is my compassion. It's it's who I am, um, and I I legitimately going to help help millions of lives by doing what I'm doing. I'm convinced of it. Of it. I, like I, you know, that I talk about it. The more I run into people, the more I tell people, the more people people are enlightened. By it, they're just like, whoa, it's crazy what you're doing. Right. And so, so I, you know, that's what I'm believing. That's what I'm doing. And that's where I'm headed because of all the opportunity that, that's available. It's cra crazy to me. And let's, and I know we've been in this a little bit, but I was going to say, let's dig into the opportunity because we both been through mine was addiction. Yours is PTSD. We have this all in attitude, but now since we've been, I don't want to say on the other side, we're learning to manage everything. Now, how are you taking that focus and put in like side business? I know what you do personally because we know each other, but I want my right. listeners to know exactly yeah. how you funnel your focus. You're all in all that on the hustle side. 
Uh, for sure. So, so for me right now, what I'm doing, um, I got, got, I got to have a side hustle that's not important that just kind of pays the bills, bills. But my big focus is my, my trade business. So I have little uh, teardrop, teardrop trailers that I, do that I rent out to people to go out and uh, uh, go small. So also a small car, pull them. Um, it, there's a, it's a company called Colorado Teardrop, teardrop System. So I part- partnered with this company who makes these trailers as their exclusive rental partner. Um, so I have the Colorado Teardrop, teardrop Rentals.com. That's my, my side hustle. And so I have three tra- trailers that I send out. And I legitimately give give people an opportunity to take their kids up camping and, and have a great time. Uh, uh, just go camping with the, the you know, whatever. And it's it's been such an awesome little business. I started out, I bought one one trailer and I recognize my like, gosh, there's a market for this. So now I own own three and I'll own five. Plus plus my site, I can start to host other people on my, my website for percentage. And so literally I I Took thing that I had, had that I would buy just for myself as a toy and turn it into a business. It, um, and the other thing is is just the nonprofit. And so the nonprofit is building grit. Well, well, the actual nonprofit itself is this gifting grit. Um, because because I wanted um, to keep the non nonprofit separate from the building grit brand, just so that you know anything from building building grit go to the nonprofit gift grit. And gifting grit is is a place. To, to number one, educate people on, on what's going on with, with firefighters across the U.S. And number two, it's in place to pay, pay for deductibles to make sure that firefighters get the care that they need. And let me explain why. Because when I, when I went, went to get it, I was denied um, coverage from the city I was, was working for. And I had to pay to pay out of pocket for my own treatment. And that was $5,000. And here's, here's the problem is that I never want somebody to look at the cost of five five thousand dollars to go get tre- treatment. And let me put it in perspective: the average firefighter across the U.S. US makes fifty thousand thousand dollars. So now we're going to take ten percent of the income for the for the year to pay for mental health treatment for a mental health pro- problem that was caused by the job that they were at. Tell me, tell me, there's not a problem with that, right? And so I just want to make sure because because. I have, have spoken to people, and, and one of the things that they worry, worry about is the cost of getting treatment, right? Uh, and so I, I just want to make sure that we can just, just I by the time I'm by the time this is where I want it, want it to be, no no fire will pay for their mental health treatment. Period. They will they will not be out it ever because it's wrong, it's uncalled for, and if the city cities aren't gonna pay for it, the government are gonna pay for it. I'm gonna figure out, figure out how to make it. Happen. Uh, I know there's enough people, people out there that care about people, people, and you know, most people you do talk to have some, some of a circle that is, is a fire, firefighter. It's very, very rare that I run into somebody who doesn't know somebody within their circle, circle that's a fighter. And when you tell them when, what's going on, they are shocked. They have no idea. And guess what? Guess why? Because we don't talk about it because we don't want to. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want people, we don't want to know. Work as heroes. We're firefighters. The men want to want to be us. Women want to be with us. Pay paydays and days. All this great thing about being a firefighter, right? Right. Well, there's there's bad side to it. Well, there's there's a cost. There's always a cost in every everything we do in life. And unfortunately, the cost for for this job oft leads to, to death of that individual. I mean, I want to put it in perspective. Seven out of ten firefighters walk around with undiagnosed no PSD. Seven out of ten. Same percent suicide rate. Three to five hundred a year. I mean, I mean, if if that that doesn't harm you, it should, right? Uh, and so that's why I'm doing doing what I'm doing because it's it's so, so important to me because I was almost almost as sick. Well, and I'm going to say let's end it from there. Tell everyone where we can find you on the websites and Instagrams and stuff, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure, yeah. So uh, the easiest way to find me, where you can just find all my stuff, stuff is go to my website, nick nickwingo.com. It's really got everything. Got my Facebook, my Instagram. Uh, we got a give back pro program, the book. Uh, we'll be releasing some apparel here soon. These hats, some challenge coins, coins, shirts. And all the stuff is going to be to benefit the nonprofit. It's going to be to be to fund that profit. 
So that's where you can find me. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on this podcast, brother. And, 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 you know, all the listeners out there, thanks for listening, listening to me. Thanks for my story. You know, I need your help because with your help, help this will never be, um, I'll never, never be able to do this on my own. I can't do, can't do this on my own. And so I, I am asking you to please help me raise awareness to this so we can, we can save this because your commitment to me helping me do this and save people's lives. So it is a huge deal. It's a huge cost. So if you don't know any firefighters, please, 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 please point them in my direction uh, and let's save some lives. No problem, man. Thank you very much. And uh, I will definitely have you back for part two because we got some other things to talk about too that we're passionate about. So first and foremost, thank you for part one, brother. I appreciate you, brother. I look forward to it in the future. All right, no problem.